Well, we're in our fourth week of our series in Timothy, and we have two more weeks after today, chapters five and six, and I hope they've been uh, good for you and been enjoying them. Uh, I know I have been. Uh, I want to start today by uh, having a kind of proud dad moment here, and uh, I don't know how many of you know A.V. well, but if you know A.V. and have maybe babysat her or something like that, you'll realize that uh, I'm worried one day she might be on that show Hoarders because she loves stuff so much that she hides stuff around her room so we won't throw it away. And like by stuff, I mean like little scraps of paper that are about this big that she's afraid that we'll throw away and somehow she wants to keep it even though that has no value of any kind. There's not even anything written on it, but she just doesn't want to get rid of it. And so this is kind of how she is. She very much values these things. And she even remember like when she tore it off a piece of paper and why she tore it off a piece of paper. I'm like, how are you even remembering that? Like, but she, she has all this in her mind. The other thing that I want to kind of point out before I get into the story is my grandmother always sends uh, the kids a check, or not a check, uh, $5 in cash on like the big holidays, like Easter, Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving, like those type of holidays, just as a, she gives them a card and $5. She does that for all the great grandchildren, just as a little, you know, fun thing for them. And so my daughter always very much looks forward to it. And I've had a trainer that you need to read the card before you just like freak out about the $5 because, you know, she's so excited about the $5 because it means she can buy more stuff, you know, and that's what she wants. Uh, and uh, another point, it's even so bad that she doesn't like to throw away the packaging for the toys she buys. She tries to find some use for it in the play. And I'm like, it is literally trash that came, <laughs> you know, like, you know, but she just doesn't like to get rid of stuff. Well, we were in St. Louis because the same grandmother gave me a little extra money for my birthday this year to say, why don't you go do something fun with the kids? And so we went over to St. Louis, and they've never done Build-A-Bear. And so I thought it'd be fun if they got to build their own stuffed animal, you know, and kind of thing. And so we went over there and did that. And as we're driving around, we drive, and it's St. Louis, and there's a homeless man on the edge or on the road uh, looking for money. And Avi's always very sensitive to this. And if I have any cash on me, she always like, can we give them some money? And I had a few bucks on me, only a few dollars, and I gave it to him. Well, a little bit down the road, there's another person. I'm like, well, I gave my last cash I had to that last person, Avi. I don't, I don't have any more cash, and I didn't have any food to give them. So I'm just like, you know, I, I don't have anything to give them. Well, Avi had brought a purse and her wall along with her, and she said, well, I have that $5 that Grammy gave me. Can I give it to them? And I said, are you sure you want to do that? I was like, that's all the money you have. And she said, yeah, they need it more than I do. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. You know, and I was just like, that's so great. You know, but it reminded me that, you know, she's taking all this in, this this knowledge from scripture, from the things I've told her, the things that her Sunday school teachers have told her, what Ashton has told her and Quest for Christ about helping those in need and, you know, stories like the Good Samaritan and different things like that. And she's, she's soaking this up as a new believer and she's starting to apply this to her life and really letting it grow. And I, I love seeing that growing in a child. Now, I'm not just telling a story here. This does relate to my topic today. And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And Paul says this to Timothy. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Now, these things that he's talking about, he's talking about kind of addressing false doctrine, false teaching. That's what he's talking about there. But So you put these things before the brothers, you will ha- be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silliness. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying, or the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe." Now, what comes of this and what we see in this passage is kind of 
spiritual fitness. You know, we talk a lot about physical fitness. We talk a lot about how to get yourself in shape. And as you can tell from looking at me, I take that very seriously. I'm in very good shape up here. Uh, unfortunately, the shape is round instead of what you're supposed to be. And so, um, you know, but we, t- we need, sometimes we focus so much on physical fitness that we forget there's other type of fitness, you know, whether it's mental fitness, making sure that your mind is good, or most importantly, spiritual fitness, we, we don't often talk a lot about that, making sure that you're spiritually fit. And whenever you're spiritually fit, it's all about putting your priorities in place on making sure your priorities are good. And so if you want to have good priorities of a good servant of Jesus, then you are needing to do certain things in order to be healthy and fit. And so what I want to do today is list a couple of things that Paul mentions in this passage that will help you be spiritually fit. And so we want to make sure that we're focused on that because that is of the most important of all the fitness that you can have. If you, have not, if you don't have mental fitness, if you don't have physical fitness, at least be spiritually fit. At least do that. Even if you don't take care of yourself in any other way, make sure you're spiritually fit. And so the very first thing that Paul mentions is that we need to get nourishment from God's word. Now, anyone that knows much about fitness, and I'm talking about physical fitness here, knows that it's not just about working out. You also have to feed your body what it needs. You have to have healthy eating and diet uh, is needed for physical fitness. And we, we see this to be true. In fact, I've seen this true in my own life. In fact, I, I haven't talked too much about it. I've told some people privately, but um, back in last May, so uh, about you know, 10, 11 months ago, I decided that uh, I needed to cut back on soda. I drank way too much soda. And so for a while there, right after that, I drank no soda. And then I started having it just occasionally. And that's kind of still where I'm at. But from the end of May, right after Jameson's birthday, through the end of the year, I lost 30 pounds just by stopping soda. And I, I unfortunately didn't do much else. That was kind of the main thing that I did. But I lost 30 pounds. Now, this year, it's been a bit of a stressful year, and I have gained 10 of it back. So I'm down 20 pounds from where I was last year at this time. But that's still something. And it started by just making a good, healthy choice for what I was intaking into my body. Now, should I probably make more good, healthy choices? Probably. But that is one thing that I could do to be more fit, to be in better shape. And it paid dividends just by that one little thing. Well, the same is true of our intake of God's word. We get nourishment, the right type of thing, when we bring in God's word into our heart. So we take healthy food into our stomach. We take God's word into our heart. And we put it there so that way we are healthy. In fact, Uh, Jesus himself has something to say about this when he's being tempted. And if you remember, he was fasting for 40 days. And I don't know about you, but I've never gone 40 days without food. I can't imagine how hungry that Jesus was. I mean, he had to be starving. There's there's a point, in fact, there's an old saying that you can go three weeks without food, uh, three uh, three days without water, and three minutes without air. That's kind of the, the benchmark. Well, I've done the math, and 40 days is more than three weeks. So he was definitely stretching himself to the limit on how much his body could handle not eating food. And here Satan is coming to tempt him at his weakest physical state. His physical fitness was the worst that it could be. And Satan comes to Jesus, and he tempts him by telling him, You have power, Jesus. Turn the stone into bread. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. He says, But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Where do you get true nourishment? From the mouth of God. The word of God right here in the Bible. If you want to be spiritually fit, then you need the word of God. You need the knowledge of God's word to fill you, to nourish you, to provide for you the good doctrine that the church and the people in the church so rightly need. 
It's the thing that Paul is addressing with Timothy when he's talking to him and saying that they need good doctrine because they have this false teaching, this false doctrine that's permeating through the church. And he's telling them, you need to be fed by God's word. Not by the false teaching, but by God's word. And this allows you to then deal with the false teaching that is going on. In Hebrews chapter 5, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic prim- principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. See, the problem is, I think that the church of Ephesus where Timothy was dealing with so many people were being led astray by the false teachers because they were still on spiritual milk. They were still focused on the basic principles. They hadn't moved any deeper. They were malnourished, and they were looking for something. They were looking for any kind of food. But the problem is, when you're malnourished, you need to eat the right kind of stuff to make yourself healthy again. You don't want to shovel anything into your mouth because that could actually make you sick because your body can't handle it anymore. It's the same thing with false doctrine. Sometimes people are so spiritually malnourished, they're looking for anything. And whether it's false doctrine within the church or another religion, they're grasping on to anything because they just need something. But the problem is they're grabbing the wrong things. What they should be grabbing is God's word. They should be grabbing the good doctrine. And so that's what you need in order to make sure that you're spiritually healthy. In fact, we see that the kind of things that we should be avoiding, he points out in Timothy. In, in uh, 1 Timothy, this chapter uh, 4, verse 7, if we want to go back to it, and it's just the first part of verse 7, it says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. But then if you remember in chapter 1, and we, and we talked about this in chapter 1, in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, As I urged you when you, I was going through Macedonia, or just verse 4, sorry. It says, Nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. You notice that twice he's bringing up this concept of you devoted yourself, you focused on myths instead of what's true. You grabbed onto the wrong thing. You're not eating spiritual food, you're eating or drinking spiritual milk. And because of that, you're being tempted by things that your body doesn't need. And so whenever we look at spiritual fitness, we see that uh, there, there is an implication that we need to be brought to a knowledge of God's word. We need to bring in God's word and let it fill our lives and that something that God's word has is filling us and making it right in us. I see this with Avi. You know, I'm constantly telling her that there are, we need to be thankful for what we have and that other people are, are more in need than we are. And I know that she's gotten those lessons in Sunday school and at church too. And it's really hit with her. Now, is she, is she a mature Christian yet, able to withstand probably all false teaching? Definitely not. She's a baby Christian and she's nine years old. But she's drawing that information in of the sound doctrine, and it's already starting to apply to her life, and I can see that within her. And I I hope to continue to nurture that within her. This is why things like discipleship are so important, because people need to be nourished. They need to continue to get teaching, correct teaching, And if we're not careful, they can get it from sources that aren't good. The internet has all sorts of things out there that is not good. Many things masquerading as good doctrine that is not good doctrine. The young Christians and the new Christians, they need people like mature Christians, those many of us in this room, to come alongside them and bring them up, whether they be people in the children's ministry or your own children or grandchildren. Take every moment you can to impart God's word, to give them true nourishment. 
In fact, I think it's interesting that in this text that it, it talks about this nourishment and gaining God's word and God's knowledge. And when it says that, it's not just something that is finished. It's something that has been done and is currently being done. That's the, the way that the word being is used there. It's it being is used in that way. It's continual. It's been done and it's going to continue to be done. We can never gain enough knowledge. There are people that have devoted their whole lives to studying Scripture, and after doing it for 60, 70 years plus, there are still things that they're learning. We can always come back to this great nourishment of God's Word to become more and more spiritually fit. But that's not the only thing that mentions. It also mentions to train yourself for godliness. If you want to be spiritually fit, you need to train yourself for godliness. And this is something that's important too. Uh, sometimes if you really want to make great impact with your physical fitness, what do you do? You change your diet. That's great. But sometimes you need to do a little more than that, don't you? You need to start burning some calories in order to get rid of some of the, the fat and excess that you have there. And so you want to actually do some exercising in order to get to your peak physical fitness. Well, for many of us, we're still trying to reach our peak spiritual fitness. We're trying to get as fit as we can spiritually. And so we need to train ourselves for godliness. Notice what it says here, though. And the first one is very much a, that you're being nourished. But the next one, it says, train yourself for godliness. Notice there's an, a word in there that wasn't in that first part. So I think there's a little bit of, even though there is a responsibility of us to read God's word, there's also a responsibility to be discipled too, that other people are going to come along and help you. But when it comes to godliness, you need to take charge of that. You need to take charge of training yourself for godliness. This is a personal responsibility. You shouldn't expect someone else to do the work for you. If you're trying to you know, get healthy. Someone can set a diet for you. You may have a nutritionist that is like, okay, this, I'm going to cook, you know, a lot of the professional athletes out there to be at their peak uh, fitness, they get personal chefs that have trained in nourishment and stuff like that. And they give them the perfect food that they need to eat. But that's only part of it. They can eat all that and they're still not going to be at peak physical fitness. What do they need to do? They need to go to the gym and they need to train. They need to lift weights. They need to do cardio. They need to do all this thing in order to get perfect fitness so they can be at the top of their game in whatever sport they're playing. It's the same for us. We need to take charge and we need to go out there and put in the, the work and the effort in order to be at our peak spiritual fitness. But notice that Paul says that while physical training has some value, there is some value to that. That way you're healthier and you're able to do God's work better because you're healthier. I think there is some value in that. But notice that he also kind of puts it in its place. He says, it has some value. It's fine. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But spiritual fitness, this spiritual training, this training in godliness is valuable in every way. Ultimate value. Why is this? Well, I believe it's the impact of it. See, the thing about physical, even more so than any of the other levels of fitness, whether it be mental or spiritual, is that it's very temporary. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you can do everything right and you're still going to get old. Your body's going to give out on you eventually. Even if you're at the peak fitness in your 20s and 30s, whenever people normally hit their peak fitness levels or peak athletic terms, eventually your body's going to age. I'm sure you've seen some of these, uh, you know, I've been watching playoff basketball a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of the games have been on TNT. And I, I like hearing what they have to say about the games. But you have Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley up there uh, talking about things. And I don't know if you've seen them. Now, they were very much big-time athletes in their day, even though uh, Shaquille O'Neal always had a little weight on them. He was very much could run up and down the court, no problem. They're, uh, and, you know, pot calling the kettle back, black here, but... They're definitely put on some extra pounds in their uh, older age. You know, they're not what they used to be. And I, it's understandable. They're not playing basketball all the time. They're not in the gym all the time. Now they're sitting behind a desk and they're talking about basketball. It's going to be hard to stay at your peak physical fitness. Well, it's the same for us. 
If we want to be at our peak spiritual fitness, we need to continue to go to the spiritual gym. We need to continue to train ourselves. We can't just give up and be like, well, I've done my part, so now I'm sitting behind the desk. I'm done training myself. I'm good now. I I don't need any more. And so physical fitness has its uh, training, or is good at times, but spiritual fitness is good in every way because its impact is not just here and now, but it's in our future life. Even when our body's given out on us, we can now be a mentor for those below us spiritually. Or what about even more importantly, after we die, where has that spiritual fitness got you? Eternity with God. And that's, that's the real key there is that physical fitness, we are going to get is only of some value because whenever we go to heaven, what are we getting? We're getting a new body. The physical fitness that we did on this earth, it's only not really important at all in the grand scheme of things when it comes to eternal aspects. And so sometimes when people spend so much of their life in physical fitness and neglect the spiritual thing, I'm like, you focused on the wrong thing here. Yes, you were in your peak physical shape as an athlete or professional athlete, but you've completely neglected the thing that's going to be long term for you. You know, we talked about this before that this life is temporary. It's only this short little aspect of time in the grand scheme of things. It's like if you had this scale of the, from one side of the room to another, our life is one little tiny dot on that of eternity. And yet we focus so much on it and not about the eternal thing. Spiritual focuses on the eternal thing. And that's what we need to focus on. But the question is, what is godliness? Well, it's trying to please God or being devoted to God or very much imitating God. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And in chapter, the end of chapter 4, it's all this ways of how you can live a godly life. And I want to read... Uh, chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, just a small section of how you live a godly life. It says, but that is not the way that you learned Christ. Notice that learning, gaining knowledge of Christ. Where do we gain knowledge of Christ? Right here. That's not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the, the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Whenever we become Christians, we have a responsibility because of what God has done in our lives to be spiritually fit and take care of what he has created within us. And so we do that by living according to God's word. And that's why these things work hand in hand together. You need to be nourished by God's word. And once you find out what it says, you do it. And that is your godly or training and godliness. And so that's what he's saying here. He's telling Timothy, if you want to stomp out false doctrine, you want to make sure false doctrine isn't in the church, you need to be nourished by the word of God. And then you need to train yourself in godliness so that way you can take care of that. And whenever we do that, we see the last thing here. And it's not one of the things that is for spiritual fitness, but it's what spiritually fitness gets us. And then when we get spiritually fit, we gain hope. When we're spiritually fit, we realize that this earth is just temporary, like I said. And it's not going to last. And it's one of the things that when I look at my daughter, I gain hope just by seeing what's in her because I know where her heart is and how she cares for other people. Now she's trying to do the right thing. In fact, just this morning, Jameson, because siblings, said something kind of a little mean to her. And A.V. told him, and maybe in a slightly braggy way, but I'll forgive her, she is a, a new Christian. But she's like, I'm going to be nice to you because it's what God wants me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so like, but I appreciate it because you can tell she's in her mind trying to do what God wants her to do. Now, does she fail at it a lot? Yeah, we all do. But it gives me hope. And I know that she has that hope because she knows that it's not just about this earth. And that's my encouragement to you today is to remember that it's not just about what is here on this earth We have hope because of what's to come. And because of that, we want to make sure that we are spiritually fit. Let us pray. Dear God.
thank you for providing your word so we can bring in the nourishment that we truly need and that it will show us how we can train ourselves in godliness so we can live for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.